If you're going to be giving a lightning talk, can you be ready down at the bottom? The, the, we've got just enough time to fit them all in, and we're going to be sure that people will uh, be kept to time and then thrown off the stage unceremoniously. Um, Marcus is ready to beat them up with his uh, sticks here. Yeah. So if you're if you're ready, if you're got, if you're going to be the next talk, just be ready to to leap up. There's a little place you can stand behind the screen. It'll be excellent. So lightning talks. I'm going to get the Smurf out of the way and just uh, let the talks begin. Can we do a quick check on the laptop audio? I just want to make sure we have audio on the laptop. Okay, good. It might be a little loud. I'll try and turn it down if it is. So I'm ready whenever time wants to start. Who's holding the time? Okay, let me know when you start the timer. I want to be... Like... All right, so I'm here to give a lightning talk on how to give lightning talks. Uh, I did one last year, and it turned into an open source project with dozens of contributors, thousands of commits, and hundreds of stars on GitHub, and it's called Appium. Um, so what was it last year at Selenium Conference in London? It was just this little thing I wrote that was part of my other talk, uh, and everyone wanted to see it. It controlled iOS apps with Selenium-like syntax. No app modification, used sanctioned automation APIs, and supported real-time debugging for iOS. So I created it back in October 2011, and then I presented it at the Selenium conference in April last year. Uh, and then about four months later, Jason Huggins calls me up and says, hey, come down to the bar, show me how this thing works. And then I presented the mobile test summit, and then in January, now it's got its current status as a project, I guess. Uh, so once again, 300 plus stars. I think we're up to 350 today. 700 issues fixed. It, Thousands of commits all in just five months. We support Android, iOS, Firefox, mobile Safari, and mobile Chrome coming next week. We do do hybrid apps on Android and on iPhone. Uh, we support, when, we have Windows and Mac GUIs. I'll show you those in a little bit. We have a record and playback interface. We run in the cloud on Sauce Labs, and we control robots. And for more on that, come to our unconference talk, the second talk on Track V tomorrow, and you will see a robot send a tweet. I'm putting pressure on me and Huggins to make that happen for tomorrow. It doesn't happen yet. Um, all right, so here's my advice for all you lightning talkers. Um, first, screenshots are better and videos are better than live demos. You have five minutes. You will look dumb, run out of time, and no one will get to find out about your awesome thing if you try and do a live demo with bad Wi-Fi. Pre-recording will keep you on track. And in that spirit, I present to you my pre-recorded Appium montage. So enjoy. the montage. Um, so second step, keep it moving. It's five minutes, no time for applause or laughter, and I didn't get any, so I don't have to, don't have to delay for it. Oh, thank you. No time for that. Silence. Uh, three, target your message. So I was looking for contributors back then. So you know, explain what you want. You know, Speak their language. Hint, it's not C sharp. Uh, I love C sharp, but no one in open source likes Microsoft, and it hates them too. Uh, <laughs> Quote Jason Huggins, my goal was always to get someone drunk and have them take over my project. That was about that man over there. My quote, I got drunk and Jason Huggins took over my project. So <laughs> consider yourself one-upped. Um, limit your content. Once again, five minutes and one minute in my case. Prioritize and think about what's important. I have a tool. It can automate iOS. 
you know, you don't reinvent the universe. You know, you only have five minutes. Be prepared to lose control. Once it's out there, it's open source. Shit's going to happen. Mine has been ported three times, as you can see. It's changed names three times. At one point, I even lost the commit bit on my own project. And one day, a website cropped up and a Twitter handle cropped up. And there's currently a conference Twitter handle that I'm told is fake, but it has some followers. So anyways, if you want to know more about Appium, uh, come to our unconference talk tomorrow at 1025. Me and Jason Carr will give it. There's some link to some websites. You can look at the GitHub. You can tweet us. And if you want to see a robot, send a tweet. Be there. That's all I have. Oh, I have this stuff on. He has no mic. Okay, go. Go. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Artom, and I'm working at Yandex. Please put your hands up those who use a page object. It's nice because it's a good pattern to write a test, but there are still some problems with the page objects, and you should be known all, all of this. The, First and the main is a flat structure of page object classes, but uh, you work with a tree structure in your application. The second is uh, there is usually a lot of elements you should uh, describe in your page object, so it's kind of cluttering of your pages in your code. And the third uh, problem is element copy paste. Uh, usually you have some web elements uh, repeating from page to page in order to interact uh, with them in your test. You should co just copy paste this with all them annotation from one page to another. Uh, in order to solve these problems, we made a solution which we called HTML elements. It's based on three simple approaches. The first, of course, is bringing some kind of blocks to your page objects. It looks something like this. As you can see, you just describe uh, some Java class with web elements inside, uh, annotate it with a block annotation, and that's all. You can use, uh, you can insert it in your page object or, or another uh, block, so you can uh, uh, recreate the tree stru structure of your original pages. As you can see, we use a standard web driver find by annotation. That means you don't need anything to start using it. You, uh, you, uh, you can use it with a mix with your current project, with your web elements. Uh, the second idea is uh, typified elements, which is uh, kind of uh, unique atomic elements on your page. For example, uh, you don't uh, work with a, a common web element interface, but with a, some text on, text input, button, forms, checkbox, select box, and so on. Uh, and the third idea is uh, brain matchers, because uh, making a searchers is a major part of any test, so we decide to make this part uh, pleasurable. It looks like this. For example, assert that some element exists, or you have some option in your select box, or checkbox is selected, and so on. And the beautiful part about matchers is you can combine them. For example, you can easily create the opposite assertion, and you don't need to worry about the assertion message because it will be mag magically created by the matcher itself. Or, for example, you can apply your matchers to a list of web elements. Uh, and the good news, uh, this project is open source, and if you want to start, use it. Just add this small dependency. Uh, in conclusion, I want to say a couple of words of future of library. We very like the idea of pages generation. 
uh, because it should save you a lot of time, really. And uh, the second area is implementation of this library in other languages. Uh, fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, we use Java widely in our web test automation. So if you experience it some, in some other languages and don't want to reinvent the, uh, the wheel, please join us to, to, on GitHub. Uh, we'll, be, we'll help you as much as we can. And there are a few links. Uh, the one is our project on a GitHub. The second is uh, our Google group where we discuss all the issues and the email of our team who develops the tools for testers. That's all. Thank you. Um, is there a way to switch uh, between uh, the machine and this? So and the project? Switch, what? you press this button here. Okay. Okay, and press again. Press it again, and it goes here. And it will eventually get there. Which one would you want, laptop? Oh, uh, laptop to start with, and then I'll switch in the end. Okay. All right. Um, hello, my name is uh, Michael Klepikov. Uh, I work at uh, Google on um, making the web faster. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, using a web driver for performance testing. So why is uh, performance important? Uh, basically, uh, performance uh, is money, and performance is obviously a uh, better user experience. Uh, now, why don't we uh, automate it? Uh, why don't we test it manually <laughs> once, optimize the hell out of our pages, and um, uh, forget about it? Uh, because developers keep making changes, they uh, break performance. It's very, very easy to uh, break performance of a web page with, a, uh, with modern, uh, really complicated pages and uh, across the browsers. Uh, so that's why there is a need for automating performance tests. Uh, now, there are tools uh, that do that, like webpagetest.org and so forth. The problem is uh, they're separate tools, and it's hard to integrate them into the uh, existing continuous build tool chain. Uh, why don't we build? Uh, performance tests uh, into the uh, performance testing capabilities into WebDriver itself. Uh, then uh, you could use your existing functional tests and just enable performance testing. Ideally, basically flip a bit, say now uh, this uh, this functional test uh, becomes a performance test, and the functional test uh, is not breaking because hopefully your developers or test organization maintains it as a functional test, and it, it keeps testing your performance, and it lets you uh, monitor if something became uh, worse uh, in the application. So toward that, um, the new Chrome driver now uh, exposes Chrome uh, timeline, uh, network, and uh, page events uh, as a web driver uh, logging API. Right. Uh, how do you use that? Uh, when you instantiate the driver, when you request a session, you uh, pass uh, logging preferences, uh, which are part of the uh, session capabilities. Uh, and then you just run your test as it is with uh, no changes. Uh, there are some pro tips how you can uh, you know, uh, put stakes in the ground uh, for uh, better post processing afterwards. Uh, and there are different techniques um, uh, how to do that. Uh, and then at the end of the test, you query the logs back, and uh, there you have your performance data that you can store on the side uh, and um, you know, have your pipeline that uh, looks at uh, regressions, graphs, your results over time, and uh, so forth. Uh, and the neat thing about it is that your real test code, like the, the uh, juice of your test, doesn't um, uh, change. You can inject uh, enabling the performance logs and collecting the performance logs at the beginning and at the end as a wrapper in setup and teardown through a proxy uh, in any way that's most suitable for uh, your particular uh, setup. Now, these systems on the side let you uh, analyze uh, various components uh, of the performance and uh, let you kind of see a breakdown uh, where the page uh, was spending time as your test was running. And again, this is an interactive test, so uh, you will uh, see you know, how the uh, page is changing as the user clicks on uh, menus and types and so forth and navigates between pages. So it's not just uh, limited to page load. Uh, there is demo code here, uh, and 
I'm actually going to uh, show a demo uh, with the uh, Chrome driver. Um, let me switch to the device. Okay, there we go. Uh, so I'm running a regular web driver test that types Selenium Conference 2013, uh, opens Google News, types Selenium Conference 2013 search, and then uh, switches to web search results. Obviously, no news for us. But the web search is a lot better. Uh, and then, um, as we uh, switch back to the laptop, we see the uh, test results submitted to, yeah, to web page test here. And you can see the uh, uh, Chrome timeline captured, so you can see your you know, uh, compositing and JavaScript execution and so forth, and really analyze what was going on during the test. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't have any slides, so you're going to have to look at me or just look in the air. It's up to you. Um, I'm going to tell you, uh, it's, it's, I'm going to talk about uh, using Selenium to do production monitoring. Um, at my previous company, um, I overheard our IT director talking to our IT guy about paying some um, our hosting company $80 per user story uh, for monitoring them every, I think it was about every hour. Uh, and they were going to go ahead and do it. Uh, and I just jumped out of my chair and went, I can do that. You don't need to pay $80. You could pay me the $80 if you wanted to. <laughs> but I can do it. So I actually had a look at the tool they were using, and I can't remember the provider. Um, but it, it was a Selenium IDE by the looks of things, and I imagined it would be Selenium in the background. Um, but there were several problems if they went down that line. Firstly, you've got, set, you've got um, numerous tests to maintain. So you, you have your own test bases, but you're going to have to maintain their providers as well. Um, and also, <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's, it's something else to maintain, and you, you, you'll end up out of sync all the time when it's just more work. And in this current, you know, agile and doing things quickly, uh, we need to do things faster. So the solution I came up with was quite simple, really. I, uh, I set up a VM. I installed a, a, a .NET house, so I installed Cruise Control. Um, and I added some uh, categories to some of my tests, just basically app monitoring. Uh, to the test I already had. So they, all they wanted to do was log into the application, navigate to one page, and log back out again. So essentially, they just wanted to check that the website could talk to the DB still. Um, as a, the current monitoring provided by the host just pinged the various web servers and DB servers, didn't check that they could actually talk to each other. <coughs> so I, uh, I added it on with NUnit, and I ran it with Cruise Control. But I ran into some problems. So I was getting a lot of false negatives. Um, and I'm not sure after the talk with Kevin yesterday, I imagine it was something to do with my grid setup or just some part of the way I was running the tests. Um, so I ended up uh, having to find another test runner. So I don't know if anyone does .NET in the house, but um, I, I moved to SpecRun, which is a runner provided by the people who provide SpecFlow. And it has a capability in it called retry. So I was able to retry on failure. So I set that to two. So therefore, whenever a test failed, if a monitoring failed for any reason, it would try again. And that time, if it passed, then I would accept that the site was up. If it failed, then an alert would be sent out. <clears throat> um, so we got it up and running using cruise control. And every, every, I think it was about every 20 minutes, the test would run. Well, the monitoring would run. And it would report back passing failures. But then I ran into some more problems that, I haven't overlooked, that I'd overlooked. Some of our clients have a usage report for how many users have logged in and logged out. And obviously, it went through the roof with, uh, my, with my user logging on on 20 of our customers' sites every day. So therefore, I had to go and speak to Dev um, and ask them to remove their user from any of their reports. 
So therefore, it started now growing into the dev team and actually into the product, just a simple solution that I came up with. Um, <clears throat> so eventually, um, they, they solved that for me, uh, and now it runs continuously. Um, there's no issue. Um, it's actually proven to be very useful. So on two occasions, we've managed to know that one of the sites is broken, fix it before the phone rings, which for the current company I was in was amazing. Um, normally the customer rings and it takes us three hours to fix anything. Um, <clears throat> so that, was, uh, that proved the um, solution. And as I just said earlier, this didn't cost me anything. Um, it just a bit of my time. You already have your tests. You already have your page objects. If you hook it up to the same, um, if you use the same page objects, uh, all your monitoring tests will continue to be updated, and you very rarely have to do any maintenance at all. So if you already use CI to run your tests, uh, think about using them to monitor your production sites as well. And that's it. Thank you. by 600. Um, so this is going to be a quick talk for people who want to get into testing and aren't really sure where to start. Um, so a little background. This is, we're Bleacher Report. We're the 109th website in the US, according to Alexia. Uh, we were acquired by Turner Sports late last year. Uh, QI auto automation started about a year ago. And our pre-deploy time went from about 45 minutes to maybe 15. 15. I don't know how. Um, so, can you see it? OK. Oh, OK, cool. All right. OK, so basically we started with a spreadsheet of blockers. Um, couldn't deploy if, if something was broken. Uh, just started writing a spec for each group of tasks. Uh, ran the specs through Sauce Lab so we didn't have to do any infrastructure. And then I just created Ruby scripts to tie all the, script, uh, all the specs into suites. Um, so we're just open sourcing kind of what we've done that's not too big. Uh, I wish I would have had access to this when I started, so I kind of knew where to go. Um, it'll pretty much get you up to running in 15 minutes, and it's released under the MIT license. So a real quick look at the spec is, let's see. So you can kind of see there's different environments for different browsers, OSs, multiple staging environments, and you can run 20, oh, sorry. You can run 20 tests at a time. So it's kind of hard to get into, but I mean, feel free to email me, and I'll help you out. And then Felix is also working on something. Yeah, I'm working on uh, implementing oh, shoot. Uh, Cucumber. Um, how do I fix this? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm trying to get to there. We go. All right. So um, pretty much uh, all of our tests right now are RSpec. Uh, switching over to Cucumber because we're having some issues with communication with our product managers. Um, sure, like QA knows exactly what the tests cover, but it's hard to uh, express that amongst the entire team. So that's why we're um, switching now. All of our new features will be in this format. Um, an example of what, how, how these sentences are executed. This is what the terminal output looks like. So all I have to run is cucumber-t for tag and then complete. It'll run all the complete uh, specs that we have and then it'll run it on our staging environment uh, number three. So pretty much a product manager could just write out this, um, this feature file which is right here. Um, I don't think that's the whole, that's not the whole feature, but anyway, so the step definitions would be listed here, and you could see that each step is, is listed here with a uh, defined function for each of those. Uh, these functions are like in a page object kind of structure, and it, with just one line of code, each step is defined. Um, Let's see. 
So here in the support folder, you would see all the page files. And this is where I d declare all the classes that have all those functions uh, ready to use. Um, that's pretty much all we really wanted to cover. We're starting to open source a lot of our work now. Um, we want to give back to the Selenium community. And we do have some really cool feature or uh, some really cool projects up and coming. Um, one of them we can't really talk too much <laughs> about, but uh, it will involve Cucumber. And I know Sauce just released an update to their gem, which allows parallelization of features. So um, that's what we're going to be working on next uh, as soon as we get back from Boston. <laughs> it's making it so that each, func each feature will run simultaneously instead of just back to back to back to back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody? Oh. oh, yeah, I guess we can't do questions. Does uh, yeah, parallel tests. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know that, that gem does it, but I don't think it does it well with Sauce Labs. Yeah, it's more of an integration thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, they just incorporated it into their own uh, gem. So we only have 10 gems that we use for our entire test suite. So that makes it really easy, really quick. Uh, this test, it goes through, I can show you a list of, um, I'm not on this computer. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah to anyway, that. it goes through like <laughs> a bunch of stuff. Yeah. It's only three lines of code. Cool, thanks guys. <laughs>
I got two minutes. So, okay, I'll take questions if you have any, please. Nope. Can I cut it short? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Guys, I hear a lot of people coming in and out of the room. We've only got a couple more lightning talks. Can you hang on for 10 minutes? Because it's quite distracting having the doors slam. If you do sneak out, please don't let the door slam. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Good, good, Dave. Cool. Hi, I'm Dave Hefner. I toured to Dave on Twitter. Um, it's enough about me. Um, so on my business blog, uh, my company is called Argyle, like a pirate, Argyle. And uh, so I recently wrote about the big problem with Selenium. Um, and so a lot of people talk about the big problem with Selenium being it's slow or tests are brittle or you have false positives or it's hard to maintain. We're all here, right? We're, we're adults. We know how to solve these problems. But a lot of people out there don't. And I think that actually those problems aren't really the big problem with Selenium. The big problem is information, right? I think there's potentially too much out there maybe to sift through. Uh, maybe there's not enough for your context. It could be out of date. There's nobody who knows about your specific problem. Or maybe somebody does and they solve for it, but they didn't actually pay it forward. Um, so I think that's the big problem. And um, in this blog post on my website, argyle.com, um, I actually have like all of the information links that are available for Selenium. And it's a lot. It's kind of a fire hose for people getting started. I think that we can do better. And so the way that I'm trying to throw my hat in the ring is I started a, uh, a weekly newsletter, a free weekly newsletter for Selenium tips called Elemental Selenium. And so every week, every Tuesday morning, um, if you give me your email, you'll receive a free tip in your inbox. Examples are written in WebDriver using uh, Ruby. And basically, it's no fluff. I basically go to forums, um, Selenium users, LinkedIn forums, uh, I, um, conversations, uh, requests, office hours, like from stuff from clients, I create examples um, to be published every week. Um, it's real stuff, and uh, I take care in writing them long form. They're, they're ideally meant to be very approachable for anybody of any skill set, um, and I believe it's, it's supposed to be high quality. So uh, no ads ever, no spam, no nothing, just legit high signal, something useful that you can start using. Um, so an example of the tip is basically this. Um, it's what it is, it states the problem, it states a solution for the problem, because there's always more than one way to solve a problem. Um, and then it has example, and it has long form alongside the actual copy and line. And the idea is you should be able to take this code, plug it in, and run it, and it will work. And alongside of that, I'm actually also building an example application that, dem that demos all of the functionality that I talk about dem you know, actually putting under test. And I call that example the internet. So I'm recreating the internet on the internet. It's so meta. Um, so that's it, elementalselenium.com um, to actually sign up, or elemental-selenium, both will work. And my business uh, website for this blog post is argyle.com. That's A-R-R-G-Y-L-E.com. Any questions? Do you accept these submissions, or is this just a one-way? Right, it's, right now it's one way, but I'm, um, right now the only way to submit requests or submit tips would be just to contact me directly. So you have my Twitter. Um, I, I'm definitely responsive on Twitter as well. So great, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> So uh, I'm here to talk about the flappers. After our talk uh, in the morning, a lot of people asked us about how we are detecting flappers at Salesforce. So I thought it would be it would be good lighting talk. So we there just I've just one slide talking about what exactly flappers are, uh, how we detect flapper, and we have something called as inferred flappers and how we deal flappers at Salesforce. So what flappers are basically for us, flappers is um, something a, a test which passes an instant and then fails another instance within the same, uh, same VM environment. So uh, that's a simple definition for a flapper. How do we detect flapper? Uh, 
uh, that is again a very simple uh, way we detect flapper is all the errors during a particular run, we rerun them. And any of the test, uh, any of the test which uh, kind of failed once, uh, failed in the first run, and then passed in next run are called as flappers. And we move them to a different bucket uh, called as flappers. Those are not an actual failures. We do not create bugs for them. Like we do not create, we do not associate bugs to the check-ins. Uh, the, and we want to remove that noise from the developers who actually did the check-in. But the test owner actually gets that bug back. The, we differentiate between who did the check-in and who is the test owner. And the test owner actually gets this information that your test is kind of a flapping. Uh, so that's a flapper. And then we have something called as inferred flapper. So not, uh, not all of our tests are flapper. Some tests are inferred flapper. What, exa what, what exactly it means is the test which was which has been falling, which is failing, passing, failing, passing across multiple runs, across multiple check-ins, and we have this sliding window which moves across, and a test which is uh, failing and passing within that window is called as inferred flappers. Uh, so no, none of the inferred flap, flapper directly moves to flapper. Uh, it's kind of, a, inferred flapper is just a way, the only way we reduce noise. So for inferred flapper, again, we don't bug developers with the inferred flapper. We just uh, get, give the information back to the test owners that your flapper is kind of, uh, your test is kind of flapping. Uh, how exactly we deal with uh, uh, flappers at Salesforce? Most important thing, no noise for developers. We always, uh, uh, we always bug the test owner, not the, de uh, not the guy who did the check-in with the, with the flapper. Second, the flappers are costly, so we do all we can. Uh, as we explained earlier in the talk today, that uh, we set up environment in a pristine manner so that there are less and less flapper. Uh, environmental cost flapper, and more and more flappers are just because of the, how the tests were written uh, in first place. So that's how we deal with flapper. That's about it. Uh, anybody has any questions for me? Why do you call them flappers? Just a name. Uh, it's a flaky test. We call them flapper. <laughs> it's like passing, failing. Anyone else? How do you distinguish between actual bug and flapper? Uh, actual bug and the uh, so the so the way you distinguish uh, actual bug and flapper is uh, the bug is an error, a bug is a failure which happens consistently within a run. So when a check-in gets a VM and it's running, it's run. So we run all the failures again in the same in the same run. So if there are ten failures happening, we'll rerun them. And if all of all the ten, eight of the ten fail again, they all are the actual bugs. But two of them which pass, they are flappers. And we don't bug for that, because we know that during the same instant, a bug, uh, a check-in passed, and, in, and, a, and it's like it's in the same instant it passed. So that's kind of we distinguish between flappers. But isn't it possible that the code is actually in That's correct. So it is quite possible. So we don't want to create a bug at the same instant. We keep on rerunning them over the period of time, and if it's consistently failing at that, after that point, we send a bug back to the developer. But we just want to avoid noise at the, for, for, for the given instant. No, but could it be a bug in the code, that the code is actually intermittently failing? Also? Yeah, it, there could be a bug. We only just delay the feedback to the developer for a moment, amount, moment of time. We have this sliding window. If that bug is saying the same behavior in that sliding window, it's a flapper. But as soon as the behavior goes away in the sliding window, we go back and create actual bug for the developer. Does it run in the same environment? Yeah, it definitely runs. All the flappers are running in the same environment. That's why we call this flapper. But if the behavior happen across the runs, like in a different environment, we call them as inferred flappers, not the flappers. That means that that test is kind of behaving weirdly across multiple runs. So we'll monitor it. We will give that, give that test a special test, special behavior, and we'll continue to monitor it for a period of, a period of amount of time. And if the test continues to show that behavior, we go back and bug the developer saying that your test is kind of weird. It kind of passes, fails across the runs in a given sliding window. Okay, so for uh, so sliding window is across multiple check-ins. Uh, for a given check-in, only test runs twice if it is failing. That's all it runs. So we don't run any duplicate test unless it is failing. That's all. Only failures are run. So I think I'm done. I have one more minute. Any more questions? Thank you.